I'm with Michael Mistrata from Fellowship of Israel Related Ministries, and we're talking about Rosh Hashanah. Now, Michael, what is Rosh Hashanah? Well, Rosh Hashanah is a biblical feast uh, that's talked about in the book of Leviticus, Leviticus 23, saying in the seventh month, to the Jewish people, in the seventh month of your calendar, the first day of the month, it's actually the Feast of Trumpets. And Rosh Hashanah is what we call it in Hebrew. It's not, it doesn't actually have the word uh, trumpets in it. That's uh, Yom HaTurah. But Rosh Hashanah means the head of the year. Rosh in Hebrew is the word head. And Hashanah is the year, head of the year. It's actually the Jewish New Year. And so it's celebrated at the, on the first day of the seventh month. And so what happens is it's actually a new moon. And so you can't actually see the moon in the sky, but it's celebrating the, the Jewish New Year uh, as we celebrate at modern times. The Jewish calendar goes forward another year as well. And on that day, the Israelites are commanded to blow a trumpet a uh, hundred times. And in that blowing the trumpet process, they're welcoming in the New Year. Mm. And how will Jews across the land celebrate Rosh Hashanah? Well, based on the diaspora, at some point, Rosh Hashanah became a two-day holiday. And it actually comes from a tradition where, because this is one of the only Jewish festivals that falls on a new moon, uh, you can't actually know, especially if you're thousands of years ago, can't actually know the accurate day when the new moon is because it's invisible in the sky. And so they've celebrated it for two days just to make sure that they get the actual day in there. So in Israel, that means for two days, it's a big holiday. Uh, a lot of different employment workplaces give gifts to their employees, often, you know, a thousand, fifteen hundred shekels worth of a gift, which is really nice if you work in Israel. And families spend a lot of time together on actual Rosh Hashanah. You'll hear in the streets people blowing the shofar. Maybe it's a, a little shofar or a long shofar, it's a ram's horn. And they blow it to welcome in the new year. And even now, people will be saying to each other, uh, Shana Tova, which means, uh, would you have a good new year? And sometimes they even say, Shana Tova Umetuka, which means, have a happy new year and would it be a sweet new year? And that's kind of riddled into the tradition of Rosh Hashanah is the sweetness of the new year. So that's all over the traditional foods that we eat during this time of year. Rimonim, so uh, pomegranates are very popular this time of year. Apples and honey are very popular this time of year. And you'll, you'll see people greeting each other with gifts, sweet gifts, um, to symbolize that sweetness in the new year, having God's favor in the new year. Yeah, I was going to ask about the foods. Foods are very important here. Every holiday seems to have food, and apples and honey is the food for this. Apples and honey, it is. And it's, it's that, it's, again, it's that sweetness. And you have to kind of understand the context as well. We're coming into a time where the last month, the month of Ilul, and now the m- month of Tishri, they're times of repentance. A lot of the, the Jewish people, especially the Orthodox, do slichot prayers, prayers of forgiveness, where every morning they're up uh, praying, getting ready for these high holiday seasons. And really, we haven't had a major holiday since the spring. It's been this long summer. We've had some fast in the summer with the celebrating, the, not celebrating, remembering the destruction of the temple. And it's this time of repentance and preparation. And I think uh, Rosh Hashanah is really the first major holiday where you hear the trumpet sound. And for us as believers, we know what Paul's talked about in uh, Corinthians, where he says, at the end of the last trumpet sound, the dead in Messiah, the dead in Christ will rise, and we who are still alive will be caught up to meet him in the air. And so it's this beckoning of return, trumpets, a symbolism that comes. And some people would go as far to say, well, maybe that means Jesus is coming back sometime Rosh Hashanah one year. But I think the, the, the symbolism with these feasts is that it's, it's welcoming this time of uh, reckoning where between Rosh Hashanah and the next holiday, which I'm sure we'll talk about as well, it's these days of awe where we're, we feel this closeness to God and we're very aware that as we begin a year, we're beginning it with rep- time of repentance, beginning it thinking about thoughts about God and kind of preparing our hearts to enter into this new year. Is it a very solemn holiday? It's not. It's a very celebratory holiday. Uh, at the same time, it's happening during a solemn period of time. So you have all these prayers of, of, for forgiveness and repentance going up. Uh, it's a happy time. Everyone's greeting each other. And it's really the introduction to what will be a 
four-week period or so of holidays where we have Rosh Hashanah, and then we have 10 days, and then we have the Day of Atonement, Yom Kippur, and then Sukkot as well. So it, it really goes into this longer period of time where it's holidays. Kids are off of school often, uh, not quite yet, but th- they just started school a month ago, and then they have Rosh Hashanah, they have a holiday, they get a lot of time off, and then for Sukkot and Yom Kippur, they also get several days off. Mm. Uh, during the Western New Year, it's partying and celebrating and getting drunk and things like that, but this is completely different, isn't it? It's more of a reflection. It's it's very different. It's a reflection. It's thinking about, well, everything that's happened last year, how are we go, coming into the new year aware, thinking of God? And I made the mistake the first time I came to Israel. I came to Israel over the Gregorian calendar, New Year, expecting, oh, it'd be fun to be celebrate New Year in Jerusalem. And lo and behold, we were downtown Jerusalem, you know, New Year's Eve, and the celebration was very disappointing actually because this is the time of year now usually in september or early october when they're celebrating the new year everyone's already welcome wishing everyone best wishes would you have a sweet and prosperous new year and again it's symbolized even down to the food that we eat that sweetness is what we're wishing upon each other what we're blessing each other with what sort of scriptures do they read when they they do their time there well, a lot of time they're reading uh, out of Leviticus 23, which is where Lord spoke to Moses um, about saying to the people, on the seventh month and the first day, observe a day of solemn rest, a memorial proclaimed with the blast of trumpets. So you, they, they read that in the synagogues. Uh, also, believers in Jesus would also carry the symbolism towards that day when we will have that last shofar, that last trumpet sound, believing that Jesus will be returning and coming back. And I think that's even the greater significance that we're able to see that Jesus really did perfectly fulfill the spring feast, the spring holidays with Passover, with the Feast of First Fruits, and with uh, Shavuot, the uh, Pentecost, the Feast of Weeks. And he, he met those exactly in time. And so we as believers look forward to the day knowing that these times are not accidental. The Lord calls them his appointed times, and he works in the appointed times. And so we look forward to the day when we believe in a second coming, where Jesus will come back, set up his throne, establish on earth. And I think the fall feasts really look forward to that time uh, when he will return. And the book of life is very important as well for this holiday, isn't it? Yeah, so this this is a very interesting time of year. Again, with the time of repentance, the Jewish people traditionally believe this is the time once a year where God opens the book of life, and that's where he's writing in your name, will your name be found in the book of life this next year? And this gets even more intense as we uh, approach the 10 days after Rosh Hashanah, as we get to Yom Kippur. And people will actually say in Hebrew, they'll say, may it be inscribed, may your name be inscribed in the book. That's all they said, may your name be inscribed in the book. And that doesn't make sense if you don't know what they're referencing, but there's this belief that during this time of repentance for forgiveness, inward introspection, really searching our hearts and saying, God, search me and know me and and see if there's any way that's uh, evil inside of me, that this comes to a climax at Rosh Hashanah and at Yom Kippur. These 10 days, the days of awe, are a time where really God turns his ear towards his people to hear their cry. And we know what the Bible says, that if my people who are called by my name would humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, then I'll hear from heaven and I will heal their land. And so as we get into Yom Kippur, which is the Day of Atonement, at the end of that holiday, there, there is this closing of the book where it's like, here's your last chance to repent. Symbolically, God's closing the book for another year. And hopefully your name is found in the book of life this year. So it's a cry out even to secular Israelis, just kind of introspection, evaluating your thoughts and a way to think about how how what I'm I'm doing is being seen and noticed by God. Mm. What's your prayer for Jews around Israel at Rosh Hashanah? You know, it's interesting because during this whole season, there is this sensitivity, this uh, awareness that, oh, we want God to bless us in this coming year, the book of life. And my prayer would be that, that revelation would, would come full circle, that we would see that not only do, do we have this one time of year to be able to repent, to be able to search our hearts and cleanse our lives and rid ourselves of sin, but actually that, that promise, that offer has been offered to us all year long by, by God. He sent in him sending his son, being the perfect Passover lamb, the sacrifice for our sins. And now we have the, this ability, this, 
this time that we have this these few months, Rosh Hashanah, we can actually access God throughout the year because we have a high priest. We have someone who we can come to and have him evaluate our thoughts and our minds and our intentions and be able to bring those to him and actually live this purified life. It doesn't just have to be once a year. It could be all year long. And we don't have to wait for a special time. I think that's even uh, something that you know, a lot of the Jewish people believe during this time, God turns his ear and gives extra attention. But we also have the command from whoever wrote Hebrews, the book of Hebrews, talking about, you know, now we can come boldly before the throne of grace. And I feel like at this time of year, Jews feel like we have the ability to come boldly. But as children of God, as adopted, grafted in children of God, have the ability to approach his throne of grace with confidence all year long. And that's something we don't have to uh, think that it closes at Yom Kippur. We don't have to think, oh, I got to wait another year if I want to get forgiveness for my sins. No, that offer is for everyone, for not just Jewish people, but for the nations today. And that's in Yeshua. Okay, Michael, thank you very much. Absolutely. Thanks for having me.